hole of creeping socialism that has infected our society like a cancer. For the past 100 years, literally millions of Americans have said that they've had enough. Literally millions of Americans are educating themselves, becoming more familiar with the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and their rights. They're tired of government getting into their lives, and they've said they've had enough. Well, this last election, the people have spoke. But today, let me just remind you that the laws we live under are determined by the men and women that we elect to Congress or to the State House or the City Council. The quality of those laws are determined by the men, quality of the men and women that we elect. In our speaker this evening, this afternoon, we have that quality legislator. Experienced, been in the trenches for many years. Let me give you just a little bit of background on Ron Paul. He lives in Texas, down by the city of Galveston, I think most of you know. He serves in Congress. His congressional district is larger than the state of Massachusetts. Huge district to service. But Ron Paul started many, many years before today. When he was a student at Duke University Medical School, he began to read um, Frederick Hayek and Ludwig von Mises and became a student of the Austrian School of Economics. And later, after school, when he was in practicing his, his uh, medicine, he became greatly disturbed with when President Richard Nixon took us off the gold window. And he decided to run and do something about it. So in 1974, he ran for Congress and was defeated. Well, 1976, he won a very special election, and three months later, he was defeated again. But he came back in 1978, 1980, 1982, as a member of Congress. In 1984, he ran for President of the United States on the Libertarian ticket. He came in third. In 1988, he ran again for President of the United States on the Libertarian ticket. And uh, he didn't do quite as well as he should have. I'll tell you one thing, though. Ron Paul and Barry Goldwater were on the ticket in Louisiana. We came in third. We even defeated Ralph Nader. So, in 1994, Ron Paul ran again. And, uh, and defying all odds, the Congressional Republican Campaign Committee was against him. Newt Gingrich was against him. He ran an uphill battle. But eventually he won the primary and won the general election. And he's been in Congress ever since, fighting for the American's freedom. Ron Paul is married to Carol, has five kids, one of which, Rand Paul, was just elected to the United States Senate for the state of Kentucky. It's the only second time in the history of the Congress that a father and a son were elected from two different states. The first one was my father and me. <laughs> yeah. Truly, Congressman Paul, Dr. Paul, is a unique human being. He has established in his mind a belief system that he doesn't waver from. He's not kind of your typical politician that goes there and shucks and jives and works with compromise. He truly believes in what he speaks. Whether it's about the gold standard or the evils of the Federal Reserve or the continuing intrusion of government in our private lives, he truly is a great spokesman. We are fortunate to have with us today on campus our interpreter for liberty and freedom, 
Please welcome Ron Paul. I don't know if anybody's here that was here last year about this time. Woo! I'm on time this year. <laughs> it was a little bit late last time, but I'm delighted to see so many. I was, I was surprised to see so many last year, having come up about an hour and a half late. But the planes were running on time, and I got through TSA without hitting anybody. Woo! Even though I felt like it. <laughs> No, but it is great to be here, and I'm always pleased to go to the campuses because uh, if there's ever a place that uh, needs to realize what's happening and organize and continue the revolution, it's on the college campuses. And as you all know, there um, was an election recently, and it looks like we may be getting some help in Washington, and uh, there will be a few new people coming from Arizona, and I... I'm hopeful that will be beneficial. Now, if you're a true blue Republican, you might think that uh, everything has been accomplished. Okay. Everything has been accomplished and uh, all will be well. I happen not to be quite that optimistic. I think uh, maybe things will slow up, but we still have a long way to go. And the Republican Party doesn't have all that great of a reputation for solving problems. You know, I was energized and uh, thought that, uh, you know, in 1980, uh, when Ronald Reagan won, that things would change, not much happened. Uh, the spending continued, the deficits continued. 1994, uh, the Republicans took over the House, and I thought, wow, uh, maybe they're serious this time. And that was one of the reasons I ran in 1996, thinking that the country was changing and the Republican Party would do better. Then in the year 2000, the Republicans got control of the House and the Senate and the presidency, something they hadn't had for years. And I thought, wow, maybe this is the time that some good will come. But I think if you're realistic and just look back at those eight years, the uh, Republican Party didn't do that well. So Republicans are going to have to prove themselves. But the sentiment is different because the pressure isn't coming from the top part of the Republican Party. It's coming from the grassroots, from the Campaign for Liberty people and the Tea Party people. That's where the pressure is coming from. So we can be pleased with uh, some of the changes. I don't believe government's going to uh, change until the uh, people change. And government generally reflects the, uh, the values of the people. And the example of, uh, of auditing the Fed, I think, tells us that when the people wake up and they demand something, they can get both Democrats and Republicans to respond. So I was very pleased with what happened there, although we didn't uh, have a total victory there. We had 320 co-sponsors in the House. That means a lot of Democrats sponsored uh, the position and, and all the Republicans did too. But it didn't come because I had a great deal of influence in Washington. It's because there are enough people like you who called your congressman and said, look, we want to know what the Fed's doing to us. We want to know where they're spending the money and who they're bailing out. And because of that, the Congress, you know, uh, came around to accepting that. So the grassroots efforts and the beliefs of the people make a difference. When that doesn't work anymore, and I know there are days you have to be very frustrated with it, that the Congress, it sounds like they aren't listening at all. But if the people are loud enough about it, they will. Just think of the improvement. We had something happened in Houston uh, just this last week. Guess what? They turned off all the, the uh, highway cameras, all the traffic cameras in Houston. Yeah. Woo! And that came about by a referendum. So although we had, there's room to have a lot of complaints with the Congress and the President and everything else, there's a still a lot of pressure on the people. So if the people are complacent, if they're fat and lazy and think the government's going to take care of them from cradle to grave, uh, they're going to do it. And, uh, and until the government and the country goes bankrupt and we're there 
And that is why a, we are going to have a much greater opportunity for others to look at our views because you just can't continue to spend into prosperity. It doesn't work. There are people today that are looking at our history of the 1930s. I cannot believe this because it's such an immoral thought. It's such a horrible idea. It's so unconstitutional and it's stinking economics. They said, you know what we need is a war to get us out of our recession. That's obscene. But there are people who think that way, and the wars are perpetual, and they're not partisan. They're bipartisan, and that is the real tragedy. Monetary policy doesn't change, foreign <laughs> policy doesn't change, welfare policy doesn't change. Names change, but the attitudes stay the same. It will remain that way until the attitudes of the people change. When the attitudes of the people change, Washington will change. I believe we're in a transition. Somebody in Arizona a few years ago coined the word the revolution and spelled it in a special way. It originated here. It is a national organization now. The revolution is alive and well, and let's continue it. This last week I got rather upset, as many other Americans have, uh, dealing with uh, traveling uh, at the airports and the, with the TSA. Now, I know there are other problems, and the other day when I gave my little talk on the House floor when I introduced legislation to deal with this, for years, decades, literally, I've been complaining about our foreign policy, the stupidity of our foreign policy and how it causes blowback, the stupidity and, the, and the, the weird ideas that governments can secretly print as much money as they want, and it's good economic policy, and that we can spend at will and run up deficits at will and tax at will. I've complained about that for a long, long time, and they are very, very serious problems, and they have brought us to this crisis. But believe me, what's going on at the airports and what has happened just recently with these new rules, if we as American citizens put up with this, let me tell you, there's not much hope for us. We need to stop this tyranny at the airports. I have uh, the little bill that I introduced, and I am famous for not writing complicated bills, this one was about one paragraph. And what it does, it addresses the subject of sovereignty immunity, sovereign immunity, which is a, which is a principle that's been around a while, and it's uh, out of control in Washington, but in particular with the airports. Now what would happen if anybody in this crowd would do what a TSA agent does? Out in the open, go up and grope pictures and take nude pictures of people. I mean, what is going on here? You'd be arrested, you'd be put in jail, and all kinds of things. But are we going to remain complacent and say, oh, it's the government. They, they are allowed to do it, and they're making us safe, and therefore we have to accept it. They tell us when we go to the airport, you have to submit because you bought a ticket. And when you buy a ticket, You've given up your rights. People on national television say that and they believe it. Who ever heard of giving up your rights because you bought an airplane ticket? I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. But I got to thinking, you know, uh, if, this, if, if we remove the immunity, this would solve the problem at the airport. Because you can't sue anybody. We have two rules. Government agents can do one thing, you and I can do it, other things. But one rule in a free society is that it isn't a free society anymore if you have different rules. If government agents can do something and they have certain rules and the people have different rules, believe me, freedom is at risk. And it isn't only at the airports where the individuals are, are immune uh, from uh, perpetuating crimes. But what about, what about the idea of theft? Does government steal? Of course they steal. You know, if you, if you aren't uh, fortunate enough to have an automobile, everybody knows you can't go and steal an automobile from your neighbor because he has two automobiles. Fortunately, we still see that as theft. But they do not see it as theft if you send a congressman to steal the automobile and then he gets political points for it. When it's theft by the individual, it should be theft by the government and they shouldn't have immunity. Now what kind of 
what kind of trouble do you get into if you're a counterfeiter? You know, that's a serious crime. They recognized in the very early part of our history, in the Monetary Control Act of 1792, the Currency Control Act bill then, they were passed that and they said, no counterfeiting. 